interest in film started very early. Um, when I was seven years old, my parents had a friend who worked at Cornell University in the ornithology lab. He was a photographer and he also did work for National Geographic. And I thought he was very cool. And he would come over and have dinner with us um, pretty often. One night he brought a projector with him and some films that he had made when he was a kid about my age. And so I was really fascinated with that. And I can remember sitting in the living room with him, just asking question after question, you know, how does this work? And cartoons, how do they work? I mean, I, I remember saying, Bugs Bunny, he's, he's a drawing, but he moves, how does that work? And he explained everything. And so very quickly, I, I pretty much expressed to my parents that I wanted to learn how to do this. And they bought me a, a, a Brownie eight millimeter, you know, Kodak camera um, at a yard sale. So it was our neighbor's camera that I got. And I just started making movies back then. Um, and I read every possible book that I could get my hands on. Um, I remember my grandparents giving me books that, that I read from cover to cover and, uh, you know, just realized that this was something that I wanted to do. Many years later, I, I went to a trade school. Um, it was sort of like a workshop school, an animation school in the Philadelphia area. And um, so I, I studied there for a little while and then, you know, just varying circumstances, I wound up discontinuing that education. And I, I went to work um, doing what I could find. Uh, it had to do with film. I was determined it had to do with film. So I wound up becoming a microfilm technician at a bank <laughs> for years. And uh, you know, that, that was not very fulfilling. Uh, at that point, I was married to Tracy and she says to me, you know, you talk about this all the time. Why don't you just take on a, a film project. So made the film and then very surprising, I, I, got a, I got a call from Channel 13, public television, Channel 13 in New York. They wanted to broadcast it. And then the next thing I knew it went into national public television broadcasting, you know, distribution. And it was on for about seven years just traveling all over the country, it was seen by millions of people. And I, I knew that this is what I was gonna do. So right after that, I, <laughs> I get a, a message from my mother saying, I think I figured out what your next project is gonna be. <laughs> she had gotten a hold of a, a book called Farm Boy that was written by a man named John Babcock up in Ithaca in the area where she lives. And I, I read it and I agreed. I thought, yeah, this is, a, this is cool. I would love to do this because it gave me the opportunity to be able to go to this region where I grew up, the Ithaca, New York area, and film in all of the places that I just love to go. It's, it's a very cinematic, beautiful place. And um, once again, it got picked up by public television and it went into distribution for several years. And uh, so, you know, we kind of hit two home runs <laughs> right in the very beginning. And uh, it's been, it has been 20 years now doing this. And um, I believe we're up to working on feature length film number 12. Being a documentarian is, um, it's a challenging job. I, I learned very early on that, um, you know, the, I, I guess it was that first night that we broadcast out of Channel 13 and the next morning I, I was given the, uh, the ratings, you know, I was told how many people watched it. And it was for one hour of television on a Thursday night, it was 250,000 people. Wow. And uh, that to me 
was was kind of mind blowing. I realized that there was quite a reach with this, and th and I knew that this was just one broadcast out of one city. And uh, I thought, wow, I mean, you you put this out there, and and the 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 opportunity to be able to share information and to educate people on a broad scale is, is really there. But along with that, I realized that there was a responsibility too. you know, I did not want to be the kind of person that puts um, out opinion as, as fact. I've always recognized the fact that, um, well, two things, I guess, but first of all, uh, being truthful is, is, key you know i i would never consciously put out anything that i knew to be false and uh the the other thing is if you do find out that you've made a mistake correct it <laughs> you know uh, so there was a situation in 2009 i did a film about the architect william kreisel california architect and there was a statement that was made that he made and I, I don't think it was intentional on his part, but there, there was a, a, a historical miscommunication, shall we say, in it. And it, it made it into the film and it was, it premiered that way and it traveled to festivals that way. And uh, uh, nobody noticed or picked up on it until I did, <laughs> you know? Yeah just doing more research down the road. And I was like, oh boy, that's not good. So we did a, a kind of a rehashing of it. I, I got to do a little bit of re-editing on it. And then it was, uh, we basically pulled back the, the previous uh, screeners that had gone out and put out a new one. So it was almost identical, the film, except that this one correction had been made. And I feel really good about that. You know. Um, the worst thing would be to actually put something out that is wrong and then have it affect somebody in an adverse way. You know, I would never want that kind of responsibility. First film, Leisurama, you know, it was the first film and, you know, I was, I was, I was kind of uh, developing my, my technique, style, um, my approach at that point. And I was also interviewing people that I knew were involved with this, with this building project, the Leisurama development in, in Montauk. But there was this completely other component to, to it. And we touch on it in the film. It, it's a Russian component. You know, it, the, 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 the housing development came about because of an argument that Nixon and Khrushchev had in a kitchen at the Moscow American exhibition in Moscow in 1959. It was called the Kitchen Debate. That kitchen was designed by my grandfather and it was built by the same developer that did this development in Montauk. So when I found the interviewees for this film, I reached out to everybody that I was aware of that I could that I could get to, you know. But there's there's another side to the story that didn't get told in the original film. So uh, I can't really go back and recut that film. It's still good, but um, it, over the years, I continued to gather more and more information. And then I eventually wound up writing a, a book manuscript. And that, that will come out eventually. Um, it's called Leisurama. It's a follow-up you know, to the film. They don't contradict each other, but this kind of gives a, a, a fuller picture. So yeah. I'm looking forward to the, the day that it's out. You know, there's a, there's a trend in documentary filmmaking where a, a, a director will want to put out a definitive film on a project. And you can make that claim that your film is definitive, but it's not really true. <laughs> It's, it's, it's impossible to clearly define any given subject within an hour, hour and a half time, you know, and more information keeps coming out. Uh, you never stop learning. And, and so 
a documentary filmmaker has to be aware of the fact that they can be wrong sometimes. And that, that involves, that involves uh, a sense of humility. I'll be the first person to admit that I, I have been wrong many times. You know, that's why I'm so careful when I'm working on a project that, that I um, qualify everything, you know, that if somebody, if an interviewee makes a comment that seems maybe a little sensational or, or, you know, maybe it's different than what most people would, would know or think, then I need to really research it. The, our timing was unbelievable, you know, because we knew for years that Antonio Corsi had posed for classes that, that Norman Rockwell went to in New York around uh, 1911 or so. He even mentions Corsi in his autobiography, but have never been able to point to any work that actually, you know, we could say, yeah, that, that's Antonio Corsi in that picture. So we go there and the very last painting that we saw in the gallery that's all the way in the back was a, a picture of Daniel Boone that was um, a very early one that Rockwell did. It, it, was, it, it was in a publication about Daniel Boone in illustration, but we looked at it and it the face and the, the costume, even the hat that he's wearing is Corsi. And Tracy immediately took out her phone and pulled up a picture of Corsi wearing practically the same outfit and held it up to it and it's the same face. I mean, that, that, was, that was very exciting, but of course we can't just say, okay, this painting was, that is Antonio Corsi there. Now we have to do the research. So I've reached out to the chief curator there, we're going to try to find whatever information we can on this. Because um, on the surface, it looks as though Rockwell used some of the sketches that he had made in school uh, to draw from to make this painting, this illustration. Well, Tracy is, um, she, she is a tireless researcher, you know, she, it, it, once she gets her mind set on something that she needs to find out, you know, she will just keep going at it until she finds it. And uh, so I, I think for projects like Corsi, she has really put a tremendous amount of work into it. She, she doesn't hold back when she sees that I, I could be presenting something in a better way. She makes me sound better. <laughs> I, I, I love working with her and I just love being with her. You know, I, I would say that when I, when I sit down to watch a movie, first and foremost, I just, I want to be, I want to learn something and I want to be entertained, but you know, there, there are things that we want to look for, especially if it's a, a documentary that's sort of like a historical perspective on it, on, on any given subject. What are the references? You know, how do we know that what we're, what we're being told is, is actually the truth, you know? I mean, you can tell when, when a film is being kind of sensational, when the statements are, are coming out of left field and, and they sound incredible, but there's nothing really backing it up, except maybe a talking head saying that this is the case, you know? I, I guess don't, don't assume that everything that you see and hear is, is true, test it out, you know? I mean, for me, watching a documentary is the first step in actually learning about something because it, it should bring up questions in your mind you know, that, that you would, after watching the film, actually decide to do some reading on, do some read, go to the library, look it up, you know. <laughs> Don't just assume that everything you see is, is the way it is. And if you're watching a film just for pure entertainment's sake, I, I, I guess I'm a little different than a lot of people. When I, when I was seven years old going to the movies, 
I, I was looking at camera angles and, you know, <laughs> editing techniques, and I was just a strange kid. I, I, film is, is just as much um, art as it is entertainment. You know, I would watch a film the same way as I would study a painting in a museum. I, I think the work of, of the director and the cinematographer, the, de, the set designers, the costume designers, the look and feel of a film, the music that's in a film, you know, it's all artwork. So it's, it's going to make you feel something. And what I like to do is analyze why did that make me feel that way? The Albert Frey series that we did, it's a part one and part two, two feature length films. Um, Albert Frey was a Southern California architect, um, but he start off, started off in Europe and then came to New York and then kind of migrated across the country. But it was a five year project and it involved a lot of discovery. There's, there's been a lot published about Albert Frey over the years, but we were able to find material that had never been seen before. And it was the first time that we did a project that involved digital remastering of, of vintage home movies, old films, basically taking old grainy footage and, and uh, making it look like it was shot more recently, bringing it to life. And so that, that, was, that was really something. Plus the, just the subject uh, alone was, was fascinating. Albert Frey was just a really extremely talented, but very humble, sweet man. And I just loved being able to go through hours of footage of him talking and, you know, and just listening to the way he approached everything, the way his architecture was influenced by the environment. You know, I mean, this, this man was, was so gentle that he had actually trained the wildlife around him to eat out of his hand. He was feeding lizards, you know, um, out of his back door and, and uh, not something that, that your average person does, you know? <laughs> And so, I don't know, I just, when I watch our own, those two films, it makes me happy. So I, I guess that would be my favorite of, of the things that we've done. One or two must sees, okay. Well, you know, everybody says Citizen Kane, but I'm gonna say it too, because it is a groundbreaking film in terms of storytelling, but also cinematography. I mean, there, there were techniques developed for that film that didn't exist before that, that are still being used today. You see it all the time. And so that film, I've watched it so many times, just studying it scene by scene, you know. I think the DVD that is in the library's collection also has a, a bonus sort of, uh, behind the scenes sort of thing. And, and also it has some commentary that you can turn on that is just absolutely fascinating. So I, I would certainly recommend that one. Another film that I, I come back to a lot, I find myself watching it, you know, pretty often <laughs> is um, All the President's Men. And I think, I mean, the storytelling is very interesting because everybody knows the outcome. I mean, it's, it's a historical event, you know, something that, that was in the news. It's, it's in the history books. We all know how it ends, but it's still riveting the way it's told. It still gets you sort of on the edge of your seat, you know. You know there's, there's something about being able to uncover things that were not previously known you know, by, by the general population that, that I get a big kick out of, you know. <laughs> we came to Litchfield for one thing because it was beautiful. <laughs> we were living on Long Island pri prior to this. And, um, you know, for various reasons, we decided that we 
we, we just wanted to relocate. So we started looking kind of in a wide area. We were looking everywhere from New Jersey up to Connecticut. We wanted to be within driving distance of New York City, comfortable driving distance. We just, we were having a hard time finding a location until we came up here and visited the, the house that we wound up buying because it, it had everything that we wanted and being sort of in a, just a beautiful wooded, you know, area that's, uh, th there's so much, there's so much history here. I, I, I don't know how else to explain it, just that we fell in love with it. I, honestly, I did not realize how much mid-century modern buildings there were around here until yeah. we moved here. And now that's, that's something we haven't really talked about is that a lot of our, our films have been about mid-century modern architecture and design. And uh, so, you know, knowing that there were some Marcel Breuer structures around here, um, you know, that, that, was, that was a plus because we understood that the community understood it, you know. But then once we got here, we started realizing, oh boy, we didn't, we didn't even scratch the surface. There's so much more. So we're actually currently working on a film about New England modernism, inspired by the fact that we're surrounded by it here in Litchfield. Well, I think movies can take us out of place. It can take us to a place where we choose to be. You know, We don't have a choice as to where we are right now. We did not choose to be in lockdown for two years. <laughs> you know, we did not choose to, uh, to be dealing with many of, of the situations that basically the world in general, the entire globe is being faced with right now. Um, you know, civil unrest, all, all these different things. The movies can help us to, um, to be able to cope with it. We can take ourselves out of the current situation, even if it's just for an hour or two, and be entertained by something, learn something new, maybe expand our horizons. We can start making plans for things that we would like to see, things that we would like to do. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a way of keeping our minds active and uh, a way of keeping ourselves sane. <laughs>